All right, let's get get started. As I was mentioning last hour, there was intensive negotiations with Iraq with a view to persuading Iraqi leadership, Saddam Hussein in the first place, and others who were involved in negotiations that Iraq should withdraw its troops from Kuwait and that that was not an acceptable act of aggression and if Iraq did not comply with the decisions of the United Nations Security Council it would have to suffer the consequences and of course it had already suffered the consequences by way of imposing sanctions on Iraq and for instance uh, one of the first acts against Iraq was the closure of the pipeline uh, between Kerkük and Yumurtal Iskenderun uh, by uh, the Republic of Turkey. So uh, Turkish President Turgut Özal has taken this abrupt decision and, and uh, sort of decided to act along the United Nations Security Council resolutions before the resolutions were even issued. Well, anyway, this is a period that has to be discussed at length and this is not the proper platform right now. But what I would like to say here, uh, it is important to bear in mind that there were a series of resolutions which have led the way uh, up to the, this uh, actually major resolution 678, which actually authorized the members of the United Nations to uh, individually and collectively contribute to the liberation of the Kuwaiti territory from the invasion of Iraq. So on November 29th of uh, the year 1990, Resolution 678 authorized the use of force. And again, as you can see here, there is this reference to Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 having uh, consumed some of the intermeasures between no action and use of force, these political, diplomatic initiatives, economic sanctions, etc. Then since Iraq did not back down, did not uh, withdraw from the Kuwaiti territory, use of force was the ultimate uh, instrument and the United Nations Security Council authorized this use of force. Well of course um, the use of force was not such an easy thing to exercise uh, that quickly because there will be certain uh, consequences unless countries, other members of uh, the UN system uh, would be prepared to launch an offensive against uh, Iraq or Iraqi forces against uh, the Iraqi forces which had invaded the Kuwaiti territory. Because let me just uh, try to figure out if I can All right, so Iraqi forces had to be expelled from the Kuwaiti territory. The authorization of use of force was with the very specific and exclusive purpose of expelling the Iraqi forces which had invaded the Kuwaiti territory from Kuwaiti territory. So uh, there were a number of uh, misinterpretations of the use of force or authorization of use of force by the UN and um, and many people especially afterwards have discussed this issue debated this issue as to why the coalition forces which were formed under the leadership of the United States why they have not gone till the end till Baghdad and why did they did not topple the Saddam regime that was not the purpose of the Resolution uh, UN Security Council Resolution 678. The UN Security Council Resolution, which authorized the use of force against Iraqi units which had invaded Kuwaiti territory, was solely, uniquely uh, uh, to sort of expel the Iraqi forces out of uh, the Kuwaiti territory. The authorization was not to, you know, uh, pursue these Iraqi forces until Baghdad and change the regime or 
toppled the regime or fight against Iraqi forces inside the Iraqi territory. No, that was not the case. So this issue has to be properly understood. The use, authorization of use of force was with the unique purpose of expelling Iraqi forces from Kuwaiti territory, period. There was no other uh, purpose of the UN Security Council authorization of use of force. As I said, many people discussed, especially in the period leading up to the second Gulf War in 2003, we have heard people commenting on why the United States and coalition forces have not uh, gone till Baghdad and have not invaded Iraqi territory or used force against uh, Saddam Hussein inside Iraq. That was not authorized by the UN Security Council. This has to be properly understood. This is something that not many people maybe understood well at the time and even today. So, uh, we, as I said, in between August and March 1991, when war uh, occurred, or just the fightings have taken place inside the Kuwaiti territory, and maybe a little bit here in the Iraqi territory, uh, there is this period of several months during which, as I said, political, economic, all other measures have been discussed, debated. And finally, uh, and, and also during which there was a huge uh, number of deployments around uh, Kuwaiti territory in Saudi Arabia in the first place and in other countries in the region like Bahrain, Qatar. And, so, and uh, of course there were navies here uh, in the sea and uh, other countries have, led, have, have, have given the permission for temporary deployment of a large number of troops. If I'm not mistaken, there was a concentration of uh, 600,000 troops, 600,000 soldiers around the Kuwaiti territory who were waiting for an offensive against the uh, Iraqi forces. Of course, uh, again, there is something that you should you know, uh, keep in mind if you are going to stay in security studies. For one combatant unit, for one soldier who is going to fight and fighting actively, you need six or seven, and in some cases, eight soldiers who, of course, are doing other stuff, starting, uh, extending from cooking and to taking care of stockpiles and manu ammunition or communication and everything. So 600,000 troops doesn't necessarily mean that 600,000 of them were fighting or were ready to fight or carrying guns. So, therefore, some approximately 100,000 of them could uh, fight or could involve in actual fighting. So anyway, Iraqi forces, which were almost obsolete in many respects, because they had bought tanks or given tanks by the Soviet Union, and they were not necessarily properly maintained. The army uh, was not uh, uh, kept in good shape by way of training. And uh, during all these uh, uh, months under sanctions, pro maybe they lack some of the spare parts or maybe in the, in the, in the past. So uh, the Iraqi army, which was on paper, something uh, that might have seemed to be a powerful army, was in fact not that powerful and that was confirmed during the fightings, which lasted for about two weeks and indeed not even that much. And not many people, uh, not many people have lost their lives during this actual fighting. Of course, considering the extent of deployment and number of troops involved, one would have expected much higher number of casualties. Hopefully that was not the case. And the Iraqi army was not able to sustain a, 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 a war, uh, sustain fighting for a long time. So the uh, coalition forces, which were formed under the leadership. Of course, there was no uh, official leadership position of any country, but the United States was the one which had poured a large number of troops to the region. Then comes the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, France, which dragged its feet. I was mentioning uh, the French, uh, French position. France, uh, French politicians are known for uh, being their opposition to almost everything. 
So, and because having studied in a French medium high school, Lycée de Galatasaray, I know the French philosophy, and I can understand as to why they stood up against, primarily and in principle, against imposing some sanctions on the Iraqi people, Iraqi government, of course, that would have repercussions for Iraqi people. But uh, at the time when French uh, government politicians were talking about whether they should veto the decision of the United Nations Security Council, and if they vetoed, because they had the veto power, the UN Security Council could not take any such decision, and no such resolution could be issued, and no sanctions could be imposed on Iraq. And uh, when the French politicians, François Mitterrand, uh, etc., I mean, and other people were talking about this uh, uh, veto, using veto right of, the, of France, uh, Saddam Hussein did something one would call it crazy, and he uh, actually put uh, and, and deployed French citizens who were at the time of uh, this uh, war or invasion, for some reason in, in Iraqi territory, or maybe those uh, uh, diplomatic personnel, maybe uh, you know, uh, business people, or maybe tourists who somehow happened to be there. They, he used the human beings, women, children, and elderly people as a shield against some of the important installations, military uh, installations, military facilities. And the world has seen the, the images, pictures of women, children, hand in hand around the facilities in Iraq, who would be, of course, who would, have, uh, who would uh, lose their lives if Iraq attacked. So these pictures really uh, caused a lot of uh, anxiety and, and anger in France, and the French cabinet decided not to veto uh, uh, the, the resolution. A similar thing uh, actually happened when, again, there was this consideration about the, uh, using the veto right and Saddam Hussein uh, crashed into the French embassy building with tanks. He apologized for that. He said things have happened without his knowledge. How could it happen in a country like Iraq where al muhabarat was everywhere and they were executing everything from top to bottom uh, under the, uh, with, with the knowledge of uh, Saddam Hussein? So again, when there was this issue uh, of imposing uh, or authorizing use of force, French people, when they were talking about vetoing that because they, that would be far-fetched a, a decision from French perspective using force against Iraq. They, they, were, they were not about to accept it. But after this acts of uh, Saddam Hussein, they decided not to use their veto right. Finally, uh, again, we, come, we have come to the point of author authorization of use of force with Resolution 678. And then the war started again after 29th of November. There was a period which elapsed between November 29th and March uh, 17, 19, I can't remember exactly. And uh, sorry, in, the, in, in mid, mid, uh, mid January, March was the second war in 2003. So in mid January, between this you know, late November, mid January, there was still a period of intense negotiations. Again, Saddam Hussein did not uh, step down and did not sort of uh, uh, change its, uh, his decision and did not withdraw from Iraq. So the only option was the authorization uh, of use of force and ex uh, execution of this authorization of use of force. And then, as I said, this, uh, the fightings uh, lasted only for about two weeks. Well, in the meantime, of course, uh, during the war, there were a number of uh, missiles which were fired against uh, the Israeli territory, against Saudi Arabian territory, because uh, Saudi Arabia was considered to be an enemy of Iraq uh, under Saddam Hussein because Saudi Arabia had cooperated, collaborated with the United States and the coalition forces, and it had ho opened its territory to the deployment of uh, coalition forces, and therefore, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein ordered, gave orders to his uh, generals to launch missiles against Saudi Arabia as well as against uh, Israel. Uh, no one died because of these missiles. Only one person lost his life and that was because of heart attack, uh, because of the fear of the missiles, not necessarily missiles themselves. So these missiles 
uh, in the hands of uh, Iraq did not prove to be very effective. Hopefully, no one died because of missile attacks. Um, and some of the missiles, actually many of the missiles, have not even reached their destination. Um, so, or have gone uh, far from where they were intended to be, uh, uh, to, to hit. So, this brought us to the end of war and uh, to the resolution 687. This is something that, will, that has shaped the rest of the story, starting from 1991 to 2003. This resolution 687 had a huge impact on the pace of events, on the pace of developments, which I will uh, talk about in a moment. Let me uh, go back to, was this? Yes, 687 here. Well, this resolution, uh, I should go first back to paragraph 33, which is something that we should at all times bear in mind. If you can read here, paragraph 33, this, this one. United Nations Security Council with the resolution 687, dated uh, April 3rd, 1991, which followed the end of war, and uh, Iraqi forces have surrendered, have uh, uh, sort of stopped fighting, and they surrendered. Here it says in paragraph or article 33 or paragraph 33, uh, um, declares that upon official notification by Iraq to the Secretary General, and to the Security Council of its acceptance of the above provisions, above provisions meaning <coughs> all 32 paragraphs preceding this paragraph, number 33. So Iraq declares officially its acceptance of above provisions, all the provisions pre, uh, prior to this. A formal ceasefire, a formal ceasefire is effective between Iraq and Kuwait and the member states cooperating with Kuwait in accordance with Resolution 678. There is this clear reference to Resolution 678 because member states cooperated in, uh, with Kuwait according to 678, meaning according to the official legal authorization of the UN Security Council to use force. So this paragraph says Iraq accepts uh, a ceasefire with Kuwait and also with the coalition forces which use force against Iraq with a view to liberating Kuwait. So here um, what you have to bear in mind is that there is this formal ceasefire and subject to the uh, above provisions meaning subject to the prior paragraphs. So the ceasefire is conditioned upon uh, the uh, issues that are elaborated in the previous paragraphs. Not every single one of them, but some of them are very important, and I'll come to that, So, because the rest of the story uh, depends heavily on these issues. So what we have to bear in mind is that now that the war is over, there is not yet a peace treaty. There is this ceasefire, and this ceasefire is conditioned upon certain uh, provisions here. A ceasefire is not an ultimate uh, resolution. It is not an ultimate solution. It is an interim solution. Because if there is a stalemate between the fighting parties, no one can advance its cause, no, no one can uh, gain another inch of territory, <coughs> but keep losing men and women in, in the battlefield or in the cities. So there is no reason for fighting anymore. And they say, all right, let's stop the war because it is quite obvious that we are not going to advance our position by way of fighting, but now let's sit and talk and find a solution. And of course, the ceasefire is something, as I said, as an interim uh, solution is subject to certain conditions. And if these conditions are met by the parties, are, are observed by, by all the parties to the uh, ceasefire, ceasefire continues. As I said, since 1953, there is this ceasefire which is still in effect between North Korea 
and uh, the uh, uh, countries which have fought alongside South Korea against North Korea. So th there is no peace treaty. And since 53, there is actually this uh, ceasefire situation, which is conditioned upon certain uh, issues to be observed by this state's party. And one thing that, again, you have to bear in mind about uh, ceasefire is that if one of the parties or one of the sides does not comply with the conditions, with the provisions of the ceasefire, the other side may or may not. It is not an automatic uh, issue, but the other side may make this a case and may very well say, all right, you are not observing the uh, principles of ceasefire. You're not meeting the conditions of ceasefire. Now I'm telling you, I'm warning you that I can resort to force again unless you comply with the conditions. And if the other party insists on not complying with the conditions of the ceasefire, the other party may open fire again. And therefore, there is no need for another authorization. This issue has been discussed among the lawyers, uh, legal people, uh, uh, international law experts, as to whether the ceasefire of 1991 would still be effective uh, in 2003. Well, we'll come to that point uh, maybe today, maybe next time we meet here. But what we have to bear in mind that after a few weeks of fighting, Iraqis have surrendered and the coalition forces have found no reason to continue to fighting and they sat with the Iraqis and uh, uh, agreed upon uh, certain conditions with a view to you know, imp uh, sort of executing a ceasefire uh, and that was uh, here uh, stated in the uh, paragraph 33 of the UN Security Council Resolution 687. So because it says acceptance of the above provisions, it means acceptance of all the 32 paragraphs. But of course, out of these 32 paragraphs, some of them are much more significant. One of which, of course, uh, let me find it here. Here we go. Paragraph 8. Decides that Iraq shall unconditionally accept the destruction, removal, or rendering harmless under international supervision of all chemical and biological weapons and all stocks of agents, I mean chemical and biological agents, not spies, <laughs> and all related subsystems and components and all research, development, support, manufacturing uh, facilities related thereto, etc. And all ballistic missiles with a range greater than 150 kilometers and related major parts and repair. Decides also, and look, decides. Here the word is important. Decides also for implementation of paragraph 8. Uh, following, Iraq shall submit to the Secretary General, and it goes all the way. Um, is there a problem over there? All right. If you need to go out, you can just leave. No problem. Is there an emergency situation? All right, no hajam. Fine. <laughs> Fine. Here, um, paragraph nine, actually, here, forming of special commission which shall carry out immediate on site inspections of Iraq biological, chemical, and missile capabilities based on Iraq, Iraq's declaration and designation of any additional location by the special commission itself. And um, it goes all the way. So you will have, I mean, I will forward this email to you or uh, these links and or you can go and find on the website of the United Nations. If you go to uh, peace and security part, then you find the United, uh, UN Security Council. Then you go to resolutions and by way of they are uh, stored in the archives uh, according to the year, so you can find from their numbers. It's not a big deal. It's going to take only half a minute. But anyway, uh, for your ease, I will send these links to you. What I'm trying to say here, uh, paragraph 33, imposes a ceasefire between Iraq and Kuwait, as well as between Iraq and countries, the coalition members, which have liberated the Kuwaiti territory. That means there is a delicate ceasefire situation 
which is subject to conditions, and these conditions are accepted by Iraq, which were the provisions prior to that paragraph in which ceasefire was mentioned. And one of these paragraphs was paragraphs uh, was paragraph eight and nine and ten. And in paragraph eight, it says, Iraq shall unconditionally uh, give information uh, to a special commission which will be established with a view to destroying uh, or rendering harmless or destruction or removal of Iraqi chemical weapons capability and the material that are in relation to this uh, weapon system, manufacturing system, etc., biological weapons and ballistic missiles whose range would be uh, longer than 150 kilometers. So, uh, 100 missiles, ballistic missiles, whose range would be longer than 150 kilometers. Why do you think the United Nations Security Council allowed Iraqi uh, um, sort of uh, government or administration to retain its missiles lower than 150 kilometers range? I mean, why didn't uh, the UN Security Council ask from Iraq to destroy every single missile that it would have in its own arsenal? Why only above 150 kilometers and longer range missiles? That could be the reason for, for this. Ishra? Well, that's an answer, Vijan. Basically, same answers. Um, because remember what I said, Resolution 678, which authorized use of force against Iraqi forces, did not authorize the coalition forces to use force against Iraq all the way. The, the purpose of the resolution was to liberate the Kuwaiti territory was not to invade the Iraqi territory. So, of course, some of the fightings may have taken place uh, within the Iraqi territory as a consequence of fighting uh, itself. But the overall objective was not to go all the way to Baghdad or invade Iraqi territory or topple Saddam's regime, etc. The purpose was exclusively, uniquely to liberate Kuwaiti territory. So once uh, Iraq was defeated, and was forced to accept the ceasefire subject to certain conditions, of course, Iraq uh, was not wanted to, be, to suffer the consequences of this war beyond certain limit. Because yes, they committed an act of aggression. The situation had to be restored. Kuwaiti territory had to be liberated. Iraq had to be punished, but not beyond a certain level. Therefore, Iraq uh, uh, some other countries in the region, uh, or uh, some of the neighbors of Iraq, many countries feared, might, might have wanted to exploit the situation. And because Iraq would be uh, in a very vulnerable position, having fought and lost a war in the hands of the coalition forces, then Iran, Syria, or Saudi Arabia, or others, I mean, without naming any country, uh, uh, the UN system was concerned about some countries wishing to exploit the situation and invading Iraqi territory or launching a war against Iraq. For instance, until very recently, there was this Iran-Iraq war, 1998, uh, 1988, sorry. The war had ended, and only two years later, Iran had certain claims still, and vice versa, Iraq still had certain claims even though there was a ceasefire between Iraq and Iran. And who knows, maybe Iran might have wanted to exploit the situation. So retaining missile capability below a certain range would, uh, was considered to be uh, a minimum deterrence for the neighbors of Iraq, and therefore they would stay away from trying to exploit the situation. So that's, that's, that has to be understood. Because again, as I said last hour, some people have not 
still understood back in 2002-2003 as to why the coalition forces have not gone all the way to Baghdad. That was not allowed in the Resolution 678. Not many people consider this or know, um, know this clearly. Anyway, so this 687 is a key resolution which had far-reaching consequences for the rest of the story starting from 1991 April all the way to 2003 March. So for approximately a dozen years, 12 years, the six, uh, Resolution 687 had its uh, direct consequences for both Iraq and some other countries, including Turkey to some extent. Um, but something before that maybe, um, where is the map? We should find a map here. Here, well, well uh, during the war, certain things uh, happened. When I Iraqi, uh, I mean, uh, Bush, the father Bush was in power, George Bush, not George W. Bush, the father Bush was the U.S. president, and uh, he had given some uh, encouragement, some incentives to the uh, groups which were thus far, up until that moment, under heavy pressure of, uh, uh, of the um, uh, Saddam Hussein regime, the Kurds primarily in the north and Shia in the south, to revolt against the central authority. So in a sense, from a distance from Washington, D.C., uh, uh, George Bush, the president of the United States, made some statements which uh, encouraged the Kurdish groups as well as the Shia groups to take advantage of the fragile situation, vulnerable situation of the uh, Saddam uh, Hussein position and to revolt against, and because after all there were a coalition forces around the Iraqi territory and that United States in the first place and other Western countries and other countries like Pakistan, some other countries from other parts of the world were there. So to revolt against and maybe take over the country. And he who listened to uh, Bush uh, actually would think that if the Kurds or the Shia revolted against the central authority, I mean the United States and other countries would provide support. That was the thinking, that was the perception or the message that many people thought they, uh, they, they got from the uh, statements made by Bush. And that was the case. The Kurds have launched uh, in the north as well as Shia in the south, uh, you know, staged some demonstrations, expressed their uh, 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 will to you know, change the regime in the country. But what they had forgotten was that the Resolution 678 had not uh, uh, authorized uh, the coalition forces to enter into the Iraqi territory and to help with the rebellion groups. So uh, therefore, those in the north and in the south who were expecting uh, tangible support from the coalition forces could not get that support. That was, that was not possible. They probably had not a chance to read the UN resolution or maybe to inter interpret the resolutions correctly. So once they staged demonstrations and then no help came, no help came from uh, the US or other countries, they f figured out that they were left to to their own devices and that they were left to, to their uh, uh, own. So they started to flee the country. Because what had happened back in 1988 was, especially in Halepce, the Kurds who had revolted against Saddam Hussein with the incitements of Iran, which wanted to use the Kurds against Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war. So, and, and Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons in Halepce in, in March uh, 1988, and uh, some 5,000 or so people, mostly civilian women, children, elderly, not necessarily uh, um, Dimitri uh, people, had lost their lives. So with the, remembering that what had happened back in March 1988, this time again without the support of the West, Kurds in the north and Shia in the south have started to flee the country and go uh, enter into Iranian territory, Turkish territory in the north, and the Saudi territory. Of course, this is desert, but mostly uh, Turkey and Iran. 
So there was, there was an influx of large number of refugees. Uh, uh, you know, um, there was a humanitarian crisis. And uh, Turkish uh, sort of uh, territory had to accommodate more than 500,000 of refugees, mostly uh, coming from uh, northern Iraq. And m many more, approximately a million of them, have entered the Iranian territory. So uh, that was a very difficult situation. Again, uh, during the war uh, in, in March 1991. So, of course, uh, Turkey had to uh, deal with the consequence of the situation, try to do its utmost to provide food, shelter, and we're talking about people crossing the border into Turkish territory where the elevations are around 3,000 meters. I mean, uh, it is March, uh, and it, it is a cold season. It's not still spring or warm uh, weather, and there was, we're talking about high elevations, I mean, high altitude territory where people had to cross the border uh, through the mountains. So it was not only very difficult for them to cross the border into Turkish territory to save their lives, but also very difficult for the Turkish security units to help them out to provide shelter, food, or clothes, and other things, heating, etc. So that, that was a huge, enormous humanitarian situation which Turkey had to deal with, uh, with this situation, of course, with the help of other countries and the United Nations, disaster relief, and, and so such humanitarian aid uh, related organizations. Well, that situation was somehow uh, dealt with uh, by Iran and Turkey uh, with the help of other countries, but um, this situation was exploited uh, politically and with, uh, having some major consequences uh, by the United States in the first place and the United Kingdom by declaring some no-fly zones here along the 32nd and 36th parallels. And United States declared no fly zones in the north and in the south of Baghdad, in the north and south of Iraq, Iraqi territory. They were denied to Saddam's military, although the uh, sort of the uh, decision was or su suggested that it only limited flights over this territory, but also denied entry to these zones from o on the ground either. So Iraqi forces were not permitted to cross into the territories above 36 and below 32nd uh, par parallels. So these territories, more or less here and here, were denied to Saddam's military. This, of course, had severe consequences for primarily for Turkey. And what we have seen was the emergence and evolution of an entity, a political entity, economic entity, and more so political entity in the northern part of Iraq, which now we are still talking about, and we'll talk about it later. So the no-fly zone, actually, what we have to bear in mind is that now, this decision does not stem from any United Nations Security Council decision. It was a unilateral decision of the United States without referring to United Nations Security Council. And with the help of the United Kingdom, the United States executed this for nearly 12 years until the war started in 2003. No fly zone was imposed on Iraq uh, almost every single minute ever since. And this no-fly zone actually, as I said, required or prevented the Iraqi forces from entering into these territories. So Saddam Hussein, who was still in power after war, uh, the first Gulf War in 1991 until 2003, until the second uh, Gulf War after which he was uh, uh, seized somewhere and then executed, so he stayed in power for 12 more years, but he, had, uh, he was able to exert his control only in between this 36 and 36 and 32nd parallels. So the country was de facto partitioned, de facto sort of divided into three, north, middle, and south, 
uh, North and South denied to Saddam's forces, and therefore certain things were going on. Uh, and, and in the middle, Saddam was still uh, controlling power and still uh, having its army and, and some uh, you know, uh, military units still intact, but uh, not very much effective because of the sanctions which were uh, imposed all the more uh, tougher than used to be uh, prior to the war. So, therefore, going back to Resolution 687, what we have to bear in mind that a United Nations Special Commission was established, which was known as ANSCOM. This ANSCOM uh, was effective for quite a number of years because, remember, the, the ceasefire was conditioned upon Iraq's un, un, uh, unconditional cooperation with ANSCOM and the I, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, chemical, biological weapons plus ballistic missiles and nuclear facilities. So Iraq was asked to cooperate unconditionally without uh, creating any conditions or without dragging its feet, cooperate right away with the United Nations Special Commission to uh, destroy, remove, or render harmless its chemical weapons, biological weapons, ballistic missiles, whose range above, uh, are above 150 kilometers, uh, and destroy them, help the ANSCOM inspectors to destroy them or remove them or render them harmless, chem bio stuff, chem bio weapons, and ballistic missiles, and also to cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency to destroy its infrastructure that could otherwise pave the way to the uh, manufacturing of nuclear weapons. The IAEA has completed its task, its mandate, within like three or four years. Uh, and under the uh, leadership of Hans Blix, and who was the head of the IAEA, and Rolf Ekeus, was the head of ANSCOM. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, show these guys to you. Well, <laughs> this is Rolf Ekeus. You know the guy next to him. And uh, who else? Um, this is Hans Blix. And this is, by the way, uh, Vladimir Orlov, uh, the head of, uh, the founder of Peer Center. My Russian team will get in contact with, with him to get some information uh, with respect to Russian positions uh, for the simulation. And, uh, and this guy the, in the middle is <laughs> Richard Butler. They look like drunk people. They, they, were <laughs> they were not. Because that was right after, I don't know, maybe the whole day long uh, deliberations uh, starting from 8 in the morning till maybe 7 or 8 in the, in the evening. So after talking about all the uh, beauties in the world, <laughs> Weapons, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, and, and that kind of stuff. You become tired and you look like a drunk, but you're not. Uh, they, they were absolutely not. Anyway, so um, let's go back to this picture. Um, so ANSCOM and the IAEA were given the task of clearing or cleaning the Iraqi territory from weapons of mass destruction and the infrastructure that could be used in the production, manufacture of these uh, weapons of mass destruction. Of course, for this to happen, the Iraqi authorities had to cooperate with the IAEA people as well as the ANSCOM people. Because ANSCOM was a special commission which was established by the United Nations and uh, a number of uh, experts, for instance, missile experts, uh, ballistic missile experts, technical, I mean, technicians, technical people, and, and chemical weapons experts, biological weapons experts, all of them were gathered, uh, a draw from a large pool of experts around the world, and were gathered from, uh, uh, were gathered together to, to be dispatched to Iraq. They were sent to Iraq, and Iraqi authorities had to provide them with escorts, and also with the relevant information as to where, for instance, uh, chemical weapons were produced. Uh, for instance, they, they had to be 
they escorted to facilities in wherever these chemical biological weapons facilities uh, were and ballistic missile uh, storage facilities or manufacturing facilities were so they had to go there uh, and these weapons had to be destroyed or rendered harmless so ANSCOM operated without much difficulty uh, for several years starting from 90, 1991 and since Iraq was under pressure uh, could not resist but certain problems were created in due course and some ANSCOM inspectors uh, had gone beyond their mandate and one of which was if I can find it here uh, sorry not this one Ah, oh, yeah, here. Yeah, this guy, Scott Ritter. We'll talk about him more. He was a Marine Corps and who was very effective in uh, finding some of the hidden facilities or secret depots or uh, you know, storage facilities. And he actually was a, a pioneering people, a kind of hero among the experts, uh, experts for a while. But since uh, later on he was involved in getting some information through illegal ways or through ways which were not necessarily foreseen in the mandate, his presence in the, uh, or among the inspectors created a number of problems. So uh, we'll continue with this uh, when I come back from my uh, conferences. And um, I will send, please wait another moment. I will send these links. Uh, by email, please go over these uh, resolutions and familiarize yourselves with issues that I have mentioned here. And I'll see you on the following week on um, November, October 26th, Tuesday. Next week, you can have your sleep in the morning on Friday. All right, I'll see you on the 26th of October, Tuesday.